forgot that um, a lot of NOAC went with us. We had the wheel from the Eleanor. We had ballast from Joseph Conrad. We had um, chronometer and a sextant from Jack Wilbur. Uh, we had a sail from the Catherine, I think, and all kinds of gear and things came out of Noink, attics and cellars that went into, oh, we had the bilge pump from the MSC Berry, <laughs> and, uh, which worked wonderfully well. And we had no electronics, no through hull fittings, no running water, uh, just a sextant, chronometer, and a radio uh, receiver for eight band, you know, for weather broadcasts. So this is the track we took. We started in Noink and we headed east to the Azores, which was about, I guess, 2,000 miles. And then to Gibraltar, Canaries, Cape Verdes, Barbados, through the West Indies to Panama. Um, we'll do a little bit of that. So, Scott really sailed herself, just like Slocum says. Let's put the, the line on the, there's a line right there, running down to a cleat. She'd sail herself as long as the wind was steady, just like he wrote, Slocum wrote in his book. So here we go, off to the Azores. And on the 17th day, there it was, right where it was supposed to be. <laughs> Don Truergy taught him well at the seaport. And uh, we arrived in the Azores, which was a medieval land, totally unexpected. Um, this is the whaleboat launch, I think, getting ready to go. And those are all terraced fields up on the volcano. And these are lighters from the freighters that um, the freighter would have to anchor out and they would bring the lighters in and offload little bags of something or cars or cows or whatever. Um, and this is the island of Pico, which was right across from the island that we stayed on for a year. But most of the buildings in the Azores looked like this whitewashed uh, dirt streets. These are uh, fishing boats. So this is the town of Velas, where we ended up in, on St. George. It, by coincidence, Velas means sails. So it was a good place. And we decided that we'd had enough sailing for a while. We wanted to relax. So we stayed for a year. We um, haul the boat. They haul their fishing boats this way because there's no anchorage. The, the mountains go right down into the way down below. So this is the, the way they bring their boats. And so they thought they could do basically the same with ours. Well, ours was a little heavier than the boats their size. So they took these little wooden shoes that are in the foreground. They drilled a hole in the bottom of the stem and put a rod through and ran a line up to a donkey engine in that stone wall on the at the far end. And then the kids would take these little wooden things and um, grease them and put them up up in the bow and there's a dolly with wheels under the bilge. And then they just cranked it up and it took all day. <laughs> so here we are, uh, us in the foreground and, and the fishing boats that weighed about a half as much as we did. Uh, and we rented a house in the Azores for in Vellas for $20 a month. And we found out we were getting ripped off because it should have been five. <laughs> but we were rich Americans, so we could pay 20 um, And like I said, it was medieval. This is their getting algas. We visited five islands in the Azores. And this is algas or Caragina, the island of St. George, where we were, was a dairy, uh, agricultural. The cheese is superb. Uh, they plowed with oxen and wooden plows. And they did ritual pig killing every year and then uh, salted or made sausage out of the meat. But it was very ritualized. It, it wasn't gory or, you know, it was, it was a very somber uh, occasion. And they, they caught fish. The man on the left in the red shirt, his family adopted us. Um, and they fished off the dock, off the caiche, when they couldn't take that little fishing boat out when it was too rough. And then the man on the right would take two of those baskets and sling them on a pole over his shoulder and go bartering in the town. And uh, I don't know how many of you make bread, but I bet you don't start out by sawing the wood and <laughs> lighting the fire in your hemispherical oven uh, like, like she did. And she did that every week. 
and it was the best bread. <laughs> Uh, and this is a house down in a little village on the far side, and you can see the clothes hanging on the bush to dry. And they went down here, and to get down here, it was a good 10 or 15 minute walk with your bundles on your head down this little path. And uh, that's Manuel with an empty wine barrel. But they had grapes and they made their own, own wine. And in town, it was a very, it was Roman Catholic and very religious. This, I think, was Good Friday procession. And there were people on their knees crawling up the street. And that's the interior of one of the, one of the churches. And this was our view out our window. And that is a working windmill. And they ground corn there. That's the island of Pico. It was an active volcano. Not terribly active, but it had erupted... I guess about 10 years before we were there in 74. And so a lot of the water system wasn't working very well where we were and a lot of the ovens were broken. But they, we had, they had ox carts and this man, Joao, brought us a, a whole ox cart of potatoes when we left and a whole ox cart of firewood. And we thought, oh, how nice, not realizing this is an island. These people, this is their subsistence. And he was giving us a whole cart full of food. And we didn't appreciate it at the time. So we, we had to leave after a year. And we went, like I said, east to Gibraltar, sailing down the moonbeams. And we went to Gibraltar, and then we went to the Canary Islands and anchored, you can see our boat there in the center, uh, in Darsena de Pesca, um, in Gran Canaria. And this is Takimoto, and he was the caretaker on this um, Japanese fishing boat. And he, when he found out we didn't have running water, he said, oh, washi washi. So every couple of days he'd fill up his uh, bath in his boat, and he'd say, washi washi, and he'd make scrubbing motions. And uh, we'd line up, and uh, we had a nephew with us, and George would go first. You had to wash off in cold water, and then you got to sit in this tubs. It was about this high. There was a seat. You know, you get up to your neck in warm water. And so George went first, and when he was done, then Chris, my nephew, went. And then Gary, my older son, he went. And then Hudson. And then me. And then Molly was last. Yeah. 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 And then we went to the Cape Verdes, and you voters will be interested. When we went there, it was, we arrived in the middle of the night under full moon and anchored and woke up to this scene. Cold fired boats and that's the Ernestina when she was carrying corn in the, in the Cape Verde Islands. But it was just like nothing you'd ever seen, we had ever seen. So we had to leave there. Now we're going back across the Atlantic. Um, uh, sextants, sites, Checking out where we are. We made about 100 miles a day, or that's what we figured. One time we made 185, and other times we didn't make that much. And you had to wash, take baths, and you had to wash. And this is our family portrait in 1974. We got the dog in the Azores because they felt that the couple felt we just had to have a dog. So the owl was a good watchdog. He kept, kept a lot of problems. And so this is the West Indies we came in. We went to Barbados, and then we went down to Beckway, that's Molly, Yay. and Leon, the figurehead, in Beckway, and then on down to Cariacou, where this was the local fishing fleet that had come in for Christmas holidays. And uh, this man showed us how to uh, clean conch, so we had properly cleaned conch. And then we needed firewood, so George went out in a little boat with three natives with machetes to, to collect firewood. And he got back and he says, oh my goodness, this is in 1974 when they were having the problems in Grenada. He says, I'm going out with three natives with machetes in the woods? <laughs> but all's well that ends well. And then we loaded up to cross the Atlantic. <clears throat> Pardon me, um, the brief one on the Barbados rum that uh, uh, we used mostly for barter. Uh, this is heading toward Panama. Uh, we had company, and we found he found two clean-cut men in the um, uh, Cologne Yacht Club to help us 
with the lines, you had to have four line handlers, one bow and one, two on each bow and stern. And, and uh, we had another uh, Frenchman that was uh, interested in going in, through the canal also. It turned out the, the two clean cut men were Mormon missionaries who'd never been on boat before. <laughs> and they were really more interested in taking pictures of each other than catching the lines, but we got through. And we had a native uh, West uh, Panamanian pilot who had sailed on schooners in his youth, and he just had a wonderful time. He sailed. So from Panama, we went out to the Marquesas, and then on to uh, American Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and then Australia. Okay. This is going out to the fabled South Pacific. And it doesn't always blow. <laughs> so every one of those paper wads went out every 15 minutes, by the way, in that previous picture. I don't know how to get it back. And we rigged up an awning so that we had some shade. Um, and we eventually, you know, got some nice weather and a, and a rainbow and uh, went on. And this was Fatu Hiva. It was 37 days. I've got the information on the bottom of the pictures that I can't read. Um, this was our first um, South Pacific Island, and it was fantastic. Uh, that's Hudson watching the Lahinis. <laughs> and then the boys with those pomplamous, huge, wonderful grapefruit that were falling off the trees. Um, and they had a now this was a whaler's chapel that must have been built in the 18, early 1800s, but we went to the service there and the singing was native Marquesan singing and it was also just, you could imagine the cannibals that had been there probably 50 years before. It was something. Uh, and then we went to American Samoa. This is one of the old uh, fishing boats that would come in. The Koreans, um, had a big fishing fleet. There was a Starkist tunic factory. <laughs> and this is the quote, more modern. I think they got those boats from the Marshall Plan. From I think they ended up in Samoa from Europe. Um, and there were quite a few American boats there. It's kind of the end of the line for America. You can get that far by U.S. planes or, or boat. And, and so it's very interesting. Our government subsidizes them, and, and the Polynesian lifestyle and the American welfare system do not mix very well. <laughs> but we had to get water, so this is how we got water. We had 10 of those jerry jugs that are in the dinghy, and then we poured them into a funnel, and Hudson's got a hose going down to five 40 <coughs> sump tanks in that cargo space that Molly's standing on. That was our water. And sometimes we put, um, what was it, potassium or some kind of compound in there to protect, you know, to clarify the water. High permanganate. And then this was school for the kids. We put them in school in American Samoa. The boys had to wear a lot of lavas. <laughs> Sorry that it's, they weren't green, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm not that thing. <laughs> yeah, I've got a pillowcase that's still made out of one of those. <laughs> and, and then, the boys were in the, and then we decorated for the 4th of July. We were there for the bicentennial. And they would practice rowing these 50-man canoes. And they would come by, and our dog would... You could hear the biscuit, Tim, in the dark. You know, it would be just barely light. You could hear the man in the bow is hitting cadence. And they'd come to us and Leon would bark at them and they'd get yeah. out. <laughs> you can imagine 50 men and uh, getting a little rattled. So they were not happy with us. But each village had a boat and so they raced them. And it was quite interesting. And then they also had a bicentennial parade. There's uh, Uncle Sam there in the back on the float. <laughs> and, but we did have to leave and we went to Tonga. <laughs> 